believing without seeing. Last week I mentioned of the two appearances of Jesus in the upper room. Firstly, to the ten as Thomas was missing, and secondly, to the eleven when he was present. Poor Thomas. Thomas is often described as doubting Thomas because he demanded proof. He wanted to know that Jesus had resurrected and was alive. We assume he doubted. But could it be just that he wanted to see Jesus? Having missed out on that earlier occasion, he wanted to see him personally. But wouldn't you? I know I would. Some 2,000 years later, we have this book called The Bible. It contains the stories of Jesus, prophecy of Jesus, of men and women who sought and followed God, and many who didn't. It contains what would be a blockbuster film. Lust, murder, sex, greed, death, adultery, denial, rejection, teaching, love, slavery, and others which do not sell as well. Forgiveness, grace, acceptance, peace, and joy. To many, it's just an ancient book of do's and in particular don'ts. It's not relevant anymore. It has nothing to say of life in 2020, especially at a time of a global pandemic. But they are wrong. The Bible is alive. It's as relevant today as when it was written. In one of my favorite films, Christian films, called Joshua, a priest speaks of the acronym for the word Bible. Basic instructions before leaving earth. I love it. And it always puts a smile on my face. It is so true. However, what must happen is that what we read needs to travel from our head to our heart. This head knowledge must become heart knowledge. Only then can we believe without seeing. Only then can we reach out in faith and love to a world that is lost and facing such a modern day travesty. We need to hold on to faith rather than let it disappear away like a dissolvable tablet in water. All fizz, then nothing but cloudy water. It's effectiveness only if we swallow it and allow it to heal us. Perhaps that's what happened to Thomas. The fact that he was not with the ten must indicate something. Perhaps he had a lapse of faith. Perhaps there is a hint in the story that his absence and his attitude were linked. Now we hear about Thomas twice before this event. Firstly, in chapter 11, verse 16, where he shows incredible loyalty by offering to go to Jerusalem so that they may die with Jesus. I'm not sure if that's loyalty or stupidity. A few chapters later in 14, verse 5, we hear him again after Jesus speaks words that are frequently used at funerals. Jesus says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there were many mansions. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? Please read the first five verses in that chapter. However, it is Thomas that becomes the spokesperson for those who have yet to understand that Jesus was going away to the Father. Thomas says, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus' response is one for us all. One which is as relevant then as is now. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, it would be so easy to go off on a tangent here and bring you a gospel message, but we need to get back to Thomas. I'd admit there is 
little here to base an argument on. But just go with me a little bit further. Why do we not hear about Thomas after this event, after the cross? Perhaps it was the cross that was so overwhelming for him that he just had to go away or go alone to try and understand it. And that is why he missed that first appearance of Jesus in the upper room. Can you begin to see it might be a character trait that we are seeing of Thomas? But before we go a little bit further, look at the words of Jesus in John 20, verse 29. It says, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. I'll say that again. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Words so relevant to us today as New Testament readers. So let us consider some of the ingredients of doubt as seen in Thomas's case. Firstly, disposition. You see, it was most likely Thomas's personality that was his problem. If you are of a gloomy, pessimistic, pessimistic persuasion, then how can you make something positive out of being told something that would be too good to be true? How can there be a happy ever after if you can't see the full picture? If you're of that persuasion, how can you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Is this beginning to make sense now? If that was Thomas's first mistake, then isolation was his next. He chose to cut himself off from the disciples, like I said earlier, to try and work it out himself. Or maybe he was just disillusioned for what they stood for. It is sad when Christians stop coming to church. They may have their reasons, and they may be valid, but aren't we told to continue in the faith and the importance of meeting together? I love the old quote of a former minister friend who described fellowship as a lot of fellows in a ship. Rye quoted in the message of John by John Bruce, sorry, by Bruce Milne says, how much Christians may lose by not regularly attending gatherings of God's people. The very sermon that we needless, needlessly miss may contain the message our souls need. The very assembly of praise and prayer from which we strayed away may be the very gathering that would have cheered, established and uplifted our hearts. Thirdly, there is the ingredient of contradiction. Thomas could not get over Jesus on the cross. Nothing would comfort him. Not that of his fellow disciples, the testimonies of the women, no clear teaching in the scriptures, or in fact that of Jesus teaching himself. He had allowed a seed of doubt to enter all that he had heard and witnessed to contradict all that he had previously believed. Like those early day viruses on computers, a start with a little blot on the screen where eventually it takes over the whole screen, leaving us powerless. Maybe you are Thomas, a doubter, a pessimist. Maybe you have placed yourself in isolation and view your past teaching or past pastor as being a hypocrite. If that is you, I want you to see what Jesus does. What does Jesus do to Thomas in that upper room? Does he reject him? No. Does he chastise him? No. Well, maybe a little. It is possible that this second appearance in the upper room was just purely for Thomas. You see, it's not a sin to doubt. But Jesus still says, Stop being a doubter and show yourself as a believer. 
All around Thomas, there were grounds for faith. And all around us, there are grounds of faith. We just need to have eyes to see that. Jesus calls us to battle through our doubts, to discover a newer and greater confidence in him. Perhaps then, like Thomas, who struggled to believe, we can stand firm and say, my Lord and my God. Thomas overcame his doubts and held on to the assurance of faith. At the beginning, I said we knew little about Thomas after the cross. But what we do know is that he was active in Jerusalem as the church was born and grew. Yet according to reliable tradition, he also took the gospel eastwards to India in AD 58, and where he also laid down his life in AD 72 by being a martyr. You see, it's okay to be a doubter if that doubt leads to becoming a firm believer. For Thomas, it was the resurrection that made the difference. And while we do not have the first-hand experience of seeing Jesus, we have a first-hand opportunity of engaging with the ministry of Jesus at a historical level. We can disagree with the words recorded in the Bible, and other sources, by non-believers even. Or we can accept and believe them. But what we cannot do is dismiss them as myths and legends. And yet we can still meet Jesus. For if he rose from the dead, as the evidence of last week clearly says, then he is the conqueror of death and therefore alive. Therefore, we, along with millions of others, can fall to our knees and say to Jesus, you are my Lord and you are my God. So in closing, we have an invitation by John to join in this fellowship of faith. In verse 31 of chapter 20, John invites us to respond by believing, by committing ourselves personally to Jesus Christ, as our Lord and God, the only one who could atone for our sins, and to follow him as he is the way, the truth, and the life. If you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Saviour, take a moment's silence and invite him into your life. If you've been away from him, Invite him back, for he will always welcome you back. Amen.